You're listening to Resist and Restore, a podcast from the Circle of Hope Pastors, where we're extending the table of our dialogue. I'm Johnny Rashid. I'm Rachel Sensenig. I'm Julie Hoke. And I'm Ben White. We have a very packed show today, full of emotions, difficult subjects, and trouble, just like 2020. This show is like 2020 in 45 minutes. So if you're ready for that kind of intensity, I suggest you keep listening. Which means that it's going to last an hour and 45 minutes. No, it will it's never not. end. <laughs> is what 45 minutes in 2020 time is like a day, you know? I know. I I'm, go ahead, Julie. I was just going to say, don't worry. The hope of Jesus is in this. We're not just focusing on the trouble. That's right. That's right. And it really, yeah, I mean... And I know we were laughing just a second ago, but I don't think it's understating it to say the horrors of 2020 keep mounting. And we just experienced a, ho- a terrible thing in Philadelphia, um, another police killing. Julie, will you t- talk to us about that and, and yeah, introduce this next segment? Yeah, my friend Raleigh's going to get us started here because this first segment is about talk back. And Raleigh is a worship leader in our congregation, and um, he wrote a litany inspired to pray and to lead others to pray in light of the death, the killing of Walter Wallace, which happened this week in West Philly. And our our city is grieving. And I really appreciated his prayer and the fact that he shared it with us. We wanted to share it with you. Even though it's a podcast and you're listening, we, we hope that you'll actually pray with us. Raleigh wrote this prayer and shared it with his uh, organization at, at work, uh, leading others to pray. And we want to pray with him, and we hope you'll pray with us. Yeah, and he works with kids, and so there's one line where it's like about our students. Um, mm-hmm. And to appropriate that for yourself, you know, you've got students in your life. You can pray for them as well. Absolutely. So um, let's start by praying together. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to read this. I mean, the, the idea of a litany is to share common words of prayer together. So this is probably the best form of talk back right now is to share a common word of prayer together. And uh, we'll, we'll put the actual words in the show notes, but for now, I'll just read it to you. Oh God, we mourn the death of Walter Wallace Jr., another black man fallen unjustly victim to police brutality in the U.S. Lord, we need a better way. Lord, we need your way. We grieve with Walter's family, his community in West Philadelphia, the country, and the world. We grieve with you, Jesus. Lord, we need a better way. Lord, we need your healing. May we not jump to intellectualizing the deeply rooted historic problem of racism or condemn how others are processing their grief. Lord, we need a better way. Lord, give us humility. May we establish alternatives to dealing with mental health crises that don't resort to violence, that restore, transform, and maintain dignity and respect for human life. Lord, we need a better way. Lord, convict us to transform the status quo. May we have the right words for the students we work with, especially those touched by this situation. Lord, we need a better way. Lord, help us be present. Lord, you gave us Jesus to show us the meaning of love. We live in a world that often operates counter to everything that you are and have always been. Give us hope. Don't allow us to succumb to despair. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. 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 I'm stuck with the despair. um, And so I need that prayer uh, that this just keeps happening. And man, just, I I keep seeing it. It, it, We keep, we keep, it keeps getting caught on camera and it's devastating. So, you know, Raleigh has us praying that we would not give in to despair. That's my prayer. 
I, I, I feel that. I think we feel that things really need to change. You know, black people have been expecting this kind of treatment from the police and living with it since the inception of our country. It's nothing new. It needs to end. It's ju it's just insane that our police uh, receive this kind of military training and that their first reaction is to draw a gun <laughs> instead of de-escalate a situation. And then all of the layers of uh, unconscious bias toward Black bodies, against Black bodies, there's a lot of there's a lot of training and retraining that needs to happen, especially in our justice system, but all around everywhere. There's a tide in the United States. And if you don't swim against it, it's going to take you. You know, that's that's how racism works here. So it's not even that you're consciously swimming with the tide. You're just it's moving you. There's a drift. And that's going to affect all of our systems. You know, those those two police. I watched the video too many times for my own health. Yeah. But I'm watching them and they get a call and they get there before the ambulance does that this mentally ill man is erratically waving a knife. It's not a fun situation for any of the neighbors in the block or the police. The neighbors are all outside and they're anxious, worried about what's going to happen. The police are there trying to do something. They And, and there's a, a lot of things that happen and a confrontation occurs and then the answer is to put 10 bullets into him. Like that whole circumstance is full of problems. And I don't, it's not even just like like, like I often say, it's not just a matter, it's not just bad apples. But that's also to point out that it's not just the responsibility of individual police to act better. We need a, this, this, mm -hmm. we need something different. This isn't working. Well, and it's also not something that I can, that I am individually not responsible for. Like, that this is the police's problem or this is the government's problem. I'm I am a citizen. I take some responsibility to that and I I I have allowed this to be done with my money. You know, like as powerless as I often feel to change things so that when that despair sets in, another world is possible and another world actually exists in other parts of the world. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Like this doesn't happen everywhere. This doesn't mm -hmm. happen everywhere that the police kill people at this mm -hmm. level, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, so I'm, I actually have some imagination for that. And because I do, I, I have a sense of responsibility to stop doing this in my name. Stop doing this with my tax dollars. Last week on the show, Rachel and Julie both shared their experiences as social workers, you know, and I would have put either of you in that situation to de-escalate this conflict and probably came out, everyone's okay, you know? Like, there are things that, Rachel's talking about how police are trained. There are ways to be trained that don't result in this. This is not, this is not ideal. <laughs> but Absolutely. Like it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a complete failure. And at some point you think, this isn't just a mistake. Is this how this is, is this working how it's supposed to work? No, they, they need they need to the, the police are called for so many things. They're called for 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 so many different types of situations that they are not trained or equipped for. And they receive funding at level the levels of which are not comparable to mental health services, crisis response services. So there is a whole imbalance in the way that the systems are set up and people's needs are not met appropriately and police are called in and it is as simple and i mean it's not simple because all of these systems are quite complex but if we decided that we wanted to spend our money differently we could like we could decide that that mental health uh needs to be funded with some of the money that is currently being funneled to police that is you being used too often to kill black people and and the city of Philadelphia, by and large, believes that, and yet we can't change it. Like that that's what leads me back to the despair. Is that like no? We I think most people think this, and yet the powerful status quo, the tide, mm -hmm. is strong and seemingly impossible to change. But the tide can actually change. That's my hope. 
And well, that, that image is really powerful because when you're caught in a tide or in the um, undercurrent, you know, you don't even know how fast you're moving and getting sucked along unless you try to put your feet down and ground yourself, or you look at the, the shoreline and see how fast you're, you're moving. But when you're caught up in it, you don't feel how fast and how strong it is. You just get pulled along. Mm -hmm. And it's moments like these when they kill Walter Wallace Jr. on camera that we can see the shore, that we can feel our feet on the ground. And it's an opportunity to know who we are because because everyone is viscerally – and same with, with George Floyd's death. Everyone in the United States is viscerally reacting to this this lynching and we see it and we know – and most of us know who we are unless we have been just completely colonized by the current. But I don't think most people are that way. I think most people think this is terrible, but they don't think they can do anything about it. They think this is the way that it is. And again, it's not. It doesn't have to be this way. Well, and I think all the protest is many people agreeing with you, Ben, and saying we're fed up. It, it, this has to change. We're we're not okay feeling small and powerless and just up against the system anymore. People are dying and it's not okay. I think Rachel Jesus is saying that too. And I have some gratitude about I mean that's saying gratitude is probably understating it, but Jesus dies on the cross. Right? In front of his mom. In front of his friend. The state kills him, you could say, you know, and I'm not trying, I'm not trying to draw too much of a, an analogy between Walter Wallace Jr. and Jesus in terms of like saviors, but Jesus relates to the experience and Jesus relates to our experience and suffers the same despair. I mean, it's not a complete, it's not all he's feeling, you know, you can't really grasp it, the hope of Jesus unless you suffer. I mean, th these things are connected, you know, and I think Jesus attunes us especially to suffering. We feel it because of how God has softened our hearts. You have to keep feeling it. Hmm. Well, the, the bishop, Christoph, uh, I, can't, I can't say his last name. He's on the Transhistorical Body blog today. Christoph, I, I'm going to butcher his last name. Check it out on circleofhope.net slash transhistorical. Um, he's a Congolese bishop that died during the Rwandan genocide protecting Hutus. And he said that there are things that, that can only be seen by eyes that have cried. Yep. That phrase came to my mind too. I read that this morning, Ben. So we're going to cry. And I think that's what Raleigh leads us to do. Many of us have been already connected to some of the peaceful protests in West Philly at Malcolm X Park and at 61st and Locust where Walter Wallace was killed. There's a, a gathering on Saturday that I'm going to go to. Some of our, our compassion teams are leading interested folks in that. And yeah, we're going we're gonna to cry out and we're going to cry for mercy and cry tears of sadness and Jesus will be with us. And so the listening audience knows Ben grew up in, in the same area of Philadelphia that Walter Wallace Jr. was killed in. And so for all of us, it's personal because, you know, the Philadelphia region is our home. But mm -hmm. to have it done in the place where you grew up very specifically. Yeah, there's something about your home place, man. A few years ago, somebody shot up a hotel or something in Southern California where I was born, right up the, the highway from my hometown. And there's something about that. It's just so powerful. It just feels, I don't know, more vulnerable or something like that. But yeah, 61st and Locust, that's my stomping grounds. I, yeah, I grew totally. up at 46th and Spruce and hung up all in, up and up and down there. I know, I know I can probably picture that block in my head. That speaks to Jesus taking on the human form and entering the neighborhood. You know, this kind of suffering, this kind of evil is not removed. He, he knew it intimately. He lived it himself in his own body and, and feels it in the same way that you feel the depth of it within you, in your own stomping grounds, Jesus, Jesus walked this earth too. 
I'm so glad that you're listening to our podcast and you get to share this space with us. We want to connect with you. We want to know you and we want to relate to you. So one way you can do that is by emailing us at resistandrestorepodcast at circleofhope.net. If you email us, we'll feature what you say on the show if you want, and we can, we can extend our dialogue even further. If you want to connect with us on Sundays, we're still meeting online at circleofhope.net slash online meeting at five on Sundays. And this month is Spiritual Ancestors Month, where we're thinking about people from the great cloud of witnesses that the writer of Hebrews talks about, people throughout our history as Christians who have blessed us, and and, and we, we want to keep that blessing going. So tune in to the Sunday meetings, especially in the month of November, um, kicking off um, with All Saints Day as we are with our ancestors this month. You can also attend one of our cells at circleofhope.net slash cells. That's really the building block of our whole community. And if I can say the most unique thing about our community is how involved we are in these circles of 10. It's a special thing about Circle of Hope, and I want you to be a part of it too. And you can also pray with us every day at circleofhope.net slash daily prayer and slash daily prayer deeper. The wind daily prayer at circleofhope.net slash daily prayer is for people that are coming to faith for the first time or maybe even re-entering their faith. And for people that, that want something a little bit deeper, circleofhope.net slash daily prayer deeper, we call that our water blog, is where we have contributors from around the community. You know, two dozen people write on it each year or more than that. And so you get a whole cornucopia of voices and that gives you some insight into Circle of Hope too. Once again, I'm glad you're listening. If you want to support us, give us a five-star review wherever you listen to this podcast. Or you can share money with us at circleofhope.net slash sharing. That'll keep this podcast going, as well as our whole church. Keep talking back to us at Resist and Restore podcast at circleofhope.net. I'm kind of excited to introduce this next section that we're doing because I'm hopeful that this will be the last time I need to talk about the 2020 U.S. presidential election because by the time we record again, we'll know who the next president is. What are the chances I'm right about that? I don't uh, know about zero, that. Zero percent chance. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm wrong. So that, a zero percent chance that I'm right means that I'm wrong. Yeah, we're good. They're, they're still going to be, I mean, what the next, I guess uh, that'll be November 10th or something, or November 12th would be the next time we would record this or put this out. And you're thinking that nine days after November 3rd, we will have a definitive answer about the I'm presidency. I'm hoping by 10 p.m. on Tuesday night, I'll have a definitive answer. <laughs> well, but I mean, some states, they're not even allowed to start counting mail-in ballots until November 3rd. Yeah, Pennsylvania is one of those states. And then there's two envelopes in our ballots. That's double the time. Yeah. So, I mean, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like Ben said before, we've been to 2016. We don't know how how it's even going to all get counted. So yeah, whatever the outcome is, is going to be contested. It, it's not going to be a quick process. Well, I don't know. I mean, just a, just a shade of hope is that some of the, the polling models show a landslide victory for Joe Biden. Like if Donald Trump wins, yeah. it, he ekes it out. And, and this is just math and it's, it doesn't mean anything. My six-year-old was, was yelling at dinner the other night, numbers aren't real. <laughs> and he he was he was upset about some simple uh, arithmetic, but there's lots to be upset about when it comes to statistics and these polling processes and all of the integrated data that they're using. So, but all that being said, what I've heard of the polling is that you know if Donald Trump wins the election, he ekes it out like he did in 2016, not winning the popular vote but winning the electoral college. Whereas there are some like you know. These are supercomputers making stuff. I don't know. But there are some models in which Joe Biden gets, you know, 300 electoral votes. <laughs> you know, like that that is conceivable according to their math. So if that happens, if it's just a landslide, they could call it within nine days potentially. But I don't think that's going to happen. So what's going to happen next Tuesday, Rachel? I hope Joe Biden gets elected to to get us out of this current regime. But I'm just putting all my cards on the table right there. 
But I, again, I'm I'm glad we're leaning into our Christian hope more than anything because no politician <laughs> is going to save us. And so uh, the thing I'm looking forward to most next week is praying with you all and taking communion together on the night before election day where we can acknowledge and and remember our oneness with Christ no matter what happens <laughs> next week. But there but there is a lot at stake. I, I believe there is a lot at stake. So I don't I don't mean to minimize that. Um what do you think is at stake in this election, Johnny? In twenty in January twenty seventeen, after Donald Trump gave his inauguration address the term alternative facts came up because they were quibbling about the size of the inauguration audience. And to Ben's point, landslide or not, contesting the results is possible because we've already proven we can't live in a reality with numbers or uh, um, common agreements or coherence. And so I think that's at stake. I want to move beyond the idea that our realities are just for us to decide. You know, I want to have a common experience again. And so I think that for me, that's the issue I'm voting on, to be honest with you. Um, are, are, you are you talking about how much Donald Trump lies all the time? Yeah, I think there's I, I, in my blog last week, I wrote and about this election and I, I, I cited someone saying 20,000 lies, which you got to you're trying to do that. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's that's just a lot of times to not be intentional about something. And I don't. The soil for my faith is rooted in truth, and I think that faith grows in an environment that values the truth. And so that's at stake for me. I mean, this sounds, I know this sounds like a huge deal, but it's, it, I think it matters. I was talking with my friend Sibo, who is from Zimbabwe, and it kind of just struck me more than it had the, the something that was at stake with this election was she said, well, I, I'm totally used to um, not having the rule of law. Mm. I, 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 I'm from Zimbabwe and, you know, I've been silenced and I've had people who have been imprisoned for speaking out against the government who are part of my family. Like this, this is normal for us. But the, the United States was always the, uh, the crown <laughs> of democracy. And we're used to looking up to the United States for its uh, reliability when it comes to the rule of law. But the fact that the question of whether we will have a peaceful transfer of power is a question at all is, you know, really disconcerting and really unique in US history. My favorite song in Hamilton is one last time when George Washington sings to Hamilton, we're going to teach him how to say goodbye. Like, like I'm even getting, like, I feel so patriotic about Hamilton. I'm sorry. But when, when Christopher Jackson sings about this, this incredibly wise thing to do to let the power go so that we can have a long-term nation and not just a flash in the pan, you know, when the French did that, when they had their revolution, it didn't happen that way. You know, we had Robespierre and the, the reign of terror and these, these megalomaniacal men just ruling for their own, their own power. So like when, when George Washington does that and he doesn't hold on to power, he doesn't become the new king because he just fought to not have a king. Like mm. it's some monumental moment in world history. It is a genius thing, and I, like I'm not, it's, I'm not saying it saves us, but it is completely unique, and it does inspire me, and it like it, it even gives me these feels that I don't totally understand, um, and it's, it is a genius of the U.S. Republic that we have this long-term, continuous transfer of power peacefully, uh, no matter what, it, it, despite tons of you know lies you know donald trump isn't the isn't the first lying president and neither was nixon you know they're all liars uh in, in one way or another but they did manage to keep the institution going in a way that has created at least a relative domestic peace compared to many other places in the world and lots of prosperity at the cost of many other places in the world but nonetheless there is something, I might even say sacred, and I'm, I don't know why I'm saying that, but I'm saying it. 
<laughs> about about this ability that George Washington did and that that Donald Trump is currently ripping up. He's taking a pickaxe to the foundation of the United States democracy. That I think that's one of the most concerning things. And I, and it took a Zimbabwean to make me realize just how serious I ought to be taking it because I wasn't taking it seriously. I was like, whatever. He, he's a piece of work. I don't, I don't believe him. He doesn't actually have any power. He's just a talking head. But her concern uh, helped me have concern. There's a certain ethnocentrism about, and, and we do this in Circle of Hope and we should do it, about highlighting the evils of the United States and the evils of the system. And they're there. They're made manifest all the time. But to make the United States like the worst nation in the world or in history is almost like the other side of making it the best nation. You know, that kind of uh, self-importance has its problems. And I'm, I'm grateful that you shared that, Ben, because, you know, I remember Hosni Mubarak was the president of Egypt for 30 years. Before he was removed by a revolution, they elected someone else. The military didn't like Mohamed Morsi. And so then they put in Sisi, who the current president of Egypt is. I guess that's one way you can transfer power, but it's painful and it's terrible, you know? And so I, I think too that the institutions of the United States, as problematic as they are, are worth preserving and not worth taking down. And in fact, not the all of the, them. <laughs> yes, yeah, not Some all of the basic ones. <laughs> yeah, but you know, that when I'll let it go for now. Too much political theory was about to come out of my mouth. So <laughs> uh, I'll spare you. What do you think about all this, Julie? I was saying this to Johnny before we started recording that essentially like I I vote with modest hope because I I don't think that a political party will save us, will make our society just for those who are oppressed. I do I do think that there are policies and measures to be taken that will make tremendous impact on those who are most marginalized and vulnerable. And so I, I hope for that, but I don't place my hope in our government. Amen. Uh, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. So you're not really jazzed up about what's going to happen. You're just kind of uh, doing the best you can with what you're given by the system and just kind of moving on. Well, I'm not just moving on. I mean, we will all see what what comes next and it could be worse. It's bad now and it could be worse. I think that I don't know. I've just I I don't know what's going to happen on a on a a national level, but like on a personal level, I've been thinking more about what it looks like to have deeper conversations with people that I love who maybe think we have the same values but have different political expressions of that. I mean, I just got a text from a friend this morning saying, please pray for me. I am in it with my mom and this is so painful and so difficult. And they completely disagree. They both follow Jesus and they come at it from two totally different perspectives and want totally different outcomes of this election. Mm -hmm. And it tears her up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it tears me up too. It's really confounding and confusing. It, it feels totally foggy. I can't understand it at all. Mm -hmm. How we can come from Jesus's story into this moment in our story together in the United States and have such radically different kind of next sentences. <laughs> we started at the same place and we've come to such different conclusions. It's, um, yeah, it's really painful. I don't understand it. What's that about? My family and I have had divergent political views since the Bush administration. and Which is the beginning of your political career, correct? Like per political involvement. I don't like, have a political career. But, <laughs> I would say yeah. like your voting career, like your, your participation yeah, pretty, directly. Yeah, yeah. That was what, Bush Kerry was the first election that I uh, voted in. But uh, my dad and I still bark about politics sometimes because that's the only way we can relate really well. I was talking to my mother the other day and she was just repeating dad's talking points. And I was like, oh, this is pretty pervasive. This is in the air. And, you know, my sister and brother-in-law are the same way. They're all red hats. My dad actually wears the red hat and, and takes selfies of himself wearing it in order to uh, provoke me. So this is the kind of, it's contentious in the Rashid clan. And he has his reasons and I understand them. But one of the reasons I, I'm at peace with our disagreement and I'm not trying to resolve it particularly is because I'm still a Christian because I found my own way to keep following Jesus. And it meant in 2003 being opposed to the war in Iraq and in 2020 
it means being opposed to uh, family separation, you know, at like the those, border. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So, we've got we've got more than 500 kids that they still can't find their parents right now because we separated them at the border as a punitive measure to discourage people from crossing the border. Which was asylum. literally what they, it's what they said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, 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 mm-hmm. was, this was done on purpose. If you come across this border, we're taking. We will kids. take your children, and they may never find you again. Mm-hmm. And some of those policies were were in place before this current administration. But I think one of the things that's so terrifying about this one and the tension it creates that that you guys are describing is that it's fairly life threatening <laughs> if you are an immigrant if you are black many women would say even if you're a woman to have a, a leader in charge that blatantly doesn't seem to value your life and says things you know in support of white supremacists and I think there is a lot at stake here and I, I think people are feeling it so intensely on either side. Yeah, and I think it has a lot to do with the rhetoric. He is just a blowhard. I don't I don't know how much he's actually been doing, but I think the people behind him have. This is the problem is that he is the um the talking head for a whole ideology or maybe he's the smoke screen for some other more nefarious ideology that's behind the scenes just doing whatever it wants in government. And yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm with you in the fear because the proof is in the pudding. His, his rhetoric has resulted in increased hate crimes against Asians, just for example. The China plague, the yep. China plague. He can't stop saying China plague. And it's just like, I mean, that is just really childish. I'm sorry. I, it disgusts me, honestly. And has devastating effects. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah but- hate crimes against Asian Americans are up, directly correlated to the beginning of the pandemic and Trump's rhetoric. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he could, I mean, it was just really an opportunity to um, unite the country. We could have really just, it could have been a great kumbaya moment to beat the coronavirus together. We were already divided, you know, like it, we, he could have brought us together. Had he taken the opportunity to just lead with some integrity against the coronavirus? I don't know, because I, I'm a real lover of the earth, too. And uh, seeing the not total disintegration of the EPA, but all the policy changes around not protecting the earth and stopping climate change. I mean, it's and a big... you can't even it, say that word at the EPA. You can't even say climate change. Wow. It's, it's kind of mind-blowing. I think a glass can only spill what it contains. And so I go with James and say, yeah, the tongue is a rudder and it, it steers this ship and it steers Trump's ship. What comes out of his mouth is what's within his heart. So I don't think, I think it was actually what you were hoping for, Ben. Was that he would be a different person? But he can't do that. <laughs> you know? and, and, and for my part, you know, and this is just coming to me now. And for my part, and this is the first time I'm even thinking about this, my opposition to Donald Trump's candidacy and presidency is in some way in his own self-interest because I don't think he becomes a different person in this office. Mm. You have to leave. You know, when I pray for Donald Trump and I do pray for Donald Trump, I pray for him to repent, resign, and then go get better. You know, this isn't, you aren't living under your best self here. You know, you're angry, vindictive, lying, hateful, mean-spirited, insulting people, demeaning them. I mean, Stokes racism and white nationalism. <laughs> You took a too big of a bite here. I don't even think you meant to do this. I think you wanted to start a TV network. You know, I still I remember his acceptance speech in 2016. He's surprised. You know, what did I get myself into? You know, and the results are terrible, like you guys are saying. Gosh, there were so many moments in this administration that hurt me when he was yelling at the congresswomen that immigrated from different countries, told them to go back to where they came from. People have told me that. Yeah. You know, it, is, it's, it's, it really hurts. Mm-hmm. You know, that love feast in, in January of 2017 when their families were stuck in O'Hare, the airport in Chicago, after, after the ban against the Middle Eastern countries. That was so emotional for me. I went up and offered communion and just couldn't believe it. I, I, and this is what Rachel's, to Rachel's point, why we need to observe communion because, and, and relate to the suffering servant in, the, in our uncertain future. I think that's really the the hope in it for me, Johnny, is is maybe what's falling away and and rising to the surface even in our uncertainty is, you know, the American project keeping us safe and secure. And I know 
white people have had the privilege of enjoying that hope more than anyone else. But there's a spiritual allusion to it and a danger for all of us, I think. And so I, I do think the opportunity here for the church is to really come together in love and by the power of the spirit, like let's dig in to what's really real. We are creating the alternative system, the, the family, the even that we have a common fund where we take care of each other in practical ways. You know, it, it's not going to solve all the problems mm -hmm. that we wish the government would solve for us. But I think maybe we're being more realistic about these days about what we can expect. Yeah, we can't expect much from this clown show. I mean, no. I'll put my cards on the table too. I, vote, I voted for Biden too, but um, not with any kind of enthusiasm at all. I'd really like a president that I would want to vote for. <laughs> You know, but but I think that maybe presidents aren't anyone that I could ever actually vote for. And this is important. One important piece that I got to get in here before we're done. Johnny mentioned this in his blog post that he mentioned earlier is that voting for a president is not a moral thing. You are not endorsing a person's personhood to vote. And I would encourage all the listeners to look at voting with this kind of provisional thing that we're doing. You're not endorsing everything they do. Yeah, the, the sacred act of voting. That's the civic religions line. Mm -hmm. that, that I'm no, that I don't, I don't. I'm not a participant in that religion. I follow Jesus. So when I come over here and I dabble in your idolatry, you know, your borderline idolatry thing that you're doing. I'm just giving the little bit of influence that I can, but I'm not endorsing you. You want to be president. You want to be commander in chief. I don't think that that should exist. You cannot seek the office that you seek and receive my endorsement. We're voting for the most good to come, not because we want to uh, endorse the person or the whole system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I, ho I hope that we could get into more of that because I think we have shifted away from that. I think that actually this is like a bygone thing. Like if there were some good old days in which policies were discussed and it wasn't a cult of personality. I think that the the 24 hour news cycle and the kind of, um, you know, just the evolution of how we're thinking about individuals and celebrity public personas. You want to get away from that? Yeah. Like we, we have to vote for a person. And so Joe Biden is trying to get me to think that he's a good guy. You know, <laughs> this is this is terrible. This sucks. I'm I voting mean, to make politics boring again. <laughs> <laughs> That's the ideal for me. Yeah. The idea of like of analyzing what what is creating the most good, Julie, like, can we have mm -hmm. a discussion about that? That isn't, mm -hmm. you know, charged with all this holiness and kind of rancor about like, you know, if you do this, like. The world will end, and if you do that, the world will also end. You know this kind of um, where this is politics. This this is like all compromise. This is all yes. concession. Mm -hmm. yes. I am, and I'm a child of God. Mm -hmm. I come in here with the light of Jesus. Like, and Jesus said, "My kingdom is not of this world." Yeah, mm -hmm. politicians mm -hmm. aren't going to reflect our values as citizens of the kingdom of God. That it's not irrelevant to people's lives, obviously, but it's not where the kingdom of God is from. And the kingdom of God is just going to keep sprouting where followers of Jesus live into the faith and hope of a Savior who laid down his life for us. All right, last segment, y'all. It's time for a spiritual show and tell. What has been nurturing your soul? We like to share the good stuff that we're getting into, maybe in our spiritual practice, or maybe in stuff that we're consuming. Consumable things are shareable things, which is nice to give y'all a gift of, hey, you could look at this, or you could read this, or listen to this, or watch this. Maybe you'll have something that you want to share. I think this stokes everyone's uh, spiritual imagination because the nurture that you're getting from God requires you to pay attention and to do something about it, to like get something. Take advantage of something, uh, show up for something. That's what this is about. And we all have that life or we couldn't do our jobs. What is it this week, y'all? Well, I made homemade cinnamon buns this morning, but that's not what I, I really want, want to share. I want you to share that with me. <laughs> Were they, are they uh, chemically everyone, naturally? Everyone loving? listening to this, if, if you give a five-star review, take a screenshot and send it to Resist and Restore Podcast at circlehope.net, Rachel will send you one cinnamon bowl. <laughs> Literally no. consumable. No matter where you live. No, because, because, because it's just going to gonna be thrown in a box, it. though, and there's not going to be any food, health, and safety, so it'll probably be gross by the time it gets to you, but right. deal with it. 
Right, and you need I'm to get it fresh out of it. question here. I say culinary, by the way. Culinary, you know, that's wrong. <laughs> Let her talk. <laughs> yeah. The, the cinnamon buns were delicious, but what what's even nourishing my soul even more is this book by the Ugandan theologian Emmanuel Katangale. One of his books is Born from Lament. What I think is useful for all of us is this idea that we can wrestle with God. We can grieve um, in fact, it's it's part of our calling, and it's a way to get to the hope that is ours too. Because Jesus suffers with us, He gets it what we're going through. And as we're designing our Advent season as a church, this keeps coming up that we need more space to grieve together and to tell our stories because it's how we keep relating to God and even move through our own pain. So. Emmanuel is inspiring me to keep doing that. What a good name to, for Advent inspiration, too. Advent is the four weeks before Christmas, y'all. Starts the last Sunday in November. Check it out at circleofhope.net slash online meeting. It's going to be great. Julie, what's nurturing your soul? I read a book with my kids this past week. It's called The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane by uh, Kate DiCamillo. And... My friend Kathy gave it to us. She had read it with her kids and uh, passed it on to us. We've been doing a neighborhood library swap because for a long time, the libraries weren't open. They are now, but I appreciated the recommendation and just taking the time to read it to them. Both my kids are old enough to read themselves and they read a lot, especially during this pandemic, which I'm grateful for, but it was nourishing my soul to that they still wanted me to read to them and to take this beautiful, sad, miraculous journey with this toy rabbit who, who goes on a journey and learns how to love. And I even shed some tears as I was reading it. And it was just, it was beautiful to have that time with my kids and to um, go to a different place with them you know, in our imaginations, in our hearts. It was, it was good. Love it. How about you, Johnny? I feel like this comes up a lot of times when there's an event that demonstrates kind of egregious police brutality, when there's a looming election that has some possibly catastrophic consequences. What nurtures my soul is the Christians that are around me that are standing in opposition to evil and doing something about it. The safety even that I feel in, in Circle of Hope specifically helps me during these times. Some people are awakening to the reality of the evils of systemic racism or um, hating immigrants, and that's good. But Circle of Hope for 25 years has been doing that, and it's, it's, it feels good to be part of a family that's doing that. And... Last Saturday, we got to welcome in new people doing this movement with us at our love feast, we call it. People, people from, some people from far away even decided to say, yes, I'm going to be on a mission with you in Circle of Hope. And that nurtures my soul. People that are, that are uh, enlisting to do this work with us, even as COVID-19 cases are going back up is in the Philadelphia region and around the country in a time where thus assuring me that this is just the time that we're in for a, for a while now. But new faith and new things happening really does encourage me. And I, I feel very, um, I'm grateful to be a part of that movement, that the church is alive and doing something with Jesus about the trouble in this world. It's encouraging to me that I have that. And honestly, I want you to have that too. You three that I'm talking to now, but the people that are listening too. So my... Spiritual So and Tell is Jesus Collective. I pray with this group of people from mostly Canada, UK, and the United States every week. And it is really nurturing to be with this crew. It's And it's so weird because it, it, it's actually it, – it's a movement that started in Canada. So it's neat to be connected with folks across these national borders and to be praying uh, regularly with them and getting to know them. And uh, it's been – it's been surprising how this half an hour of prayer has kind of punctuated my day. Like it, it's elevating my need for prayer. It's like I feel so raw and ready to kind of spill my heart out. And 
having this regular appointment in the middle of the day, which I, which I haven't done in a while to pray has been really powerful. And if you're interested in Jesus collective, check them out at jesuscollective.com. They're a movement of uh, Jesus centered churches and individuals that are trying to lift up a, an alternative in a time when an alternative is really needed. So yeah, they're my people. I'm glad to be a part of them too. Well, thanks for listening, y'all. I love doing this with you and talking about difficult things, and I hope that listeners are encouraged by it too. You can keep extending the table with our dialogue by sharing this around with people that you think would like it. We'll see you next time, y'all.